so let's go let's start lecture uh, today we're going to be talking about buffers we've talked about file uploads for uh, for at least Friday but we've mentioned it on Monday and Wednesday last week we've talked about parsing this multi-part form data mime type um, but now we need to talk about buffers some of you are starting to come across this in your homework 3 as you start supporting uploads you're getting some of these issues related to buffers, so let's address these head on and talk about buffers. Uh, this is one of those lectures where I'm not gonna I'm gonna tell you what buffers are and how to handle them. I'm not gonna go too in depth on solutions for them. Uh, I'll outline a solution, but I'm not gonna go into code and show you this is exactly what you do. Uh, some of the design will be left up to you, but not honestly not too much of it. Uh, I'll give you a good idea of uh, of what to do here. So just a quick review, when parsing these multi-part form data, you never decode this file as a string. We learned this Friday, we have this multi-part form data, you're getting the content length, the boundary from the headers, reading the content length number of bytes, looking for the boundary in those bytes, in as bytes, not as strings, extracting the image for the data, the image for the, geez, the data for the image, uh, including the names of each form input, the data for that form input in the one that's a file, you need to never convert to a string, being very careful never to convert that to a string. Uh, there's an update, there's a question I couldn't answer last time. Yes, there is a CRLF before and after each boundary. So you do have to be aware of that, that there will be a trailing CRLF. So this will be a CRLF dash dash, then the boundary from the headers, then another CRLF. So, so be aware of that, I, I didn't have a full answer on that. Uh, last time there will be a CRLF CRLF right here. There will be another one right after so don't append those two bytes to the end of your file That might corrupt your image encoding. So make sure you're excluding that CRLF that slash r slash n at the end of the bytes of your file That's something to keep a uh, keep aware of now, It may or may not actually break the encoding of the file But it might so it's something you need to be aware of if your images keep breaking uh, that's one thing to check. Do you have that extra two bytes at the end of the file? Uh, any questions on Friday's content? Actually, I'm going to take another sip of tea while I ask that. All right. Sounds good. So when you're receiving bytes from the socket, you're going to be doing something like this in whatever language you have. If you have Java, um, JavaScript with Node and the net package, you're going to be doing something like this. When the socket receives data, do something with that data. You're calling some code, or rather you're providing some code in whatever your, uh, whatever your code does that goes inside these braces. You're providing some code that's called when the event of receiving data occurs. We have event-based uh, architectures in JavaScript. JavaScript really revolves around this idea of events and then code that executes when an event occurs. So when the event of receiving data occurs, so the socket socket reacts to the, the receiving data um, event. So socket on when this event occurs, the event named data, which is the event name that when data is received, call this function with that data. So we have some way of saying, when data is received, do this stuff. Same thing with Python, you call this receive method. When I receive data and the Python method will specify, you'll specify the size of the buffer, which of course is what we're gonna talk about. The size of the buffer, which is the maximum amount of data that can be read in one call to this receive method. And then, oops, I, I left my dot strip on there. That's uh, uh, just an artifact of where I pulled this from. Um, and you're receiving that data. Now, Python, the way it's set up, if you're using socket server, you have this uh, behind the scenes is going to be in a loop that keeps calling this method. And then whenever there is data to be received, then this method will return. So your, your server will actually hang on this method, just sitting there waiting for data or rather right before that, it's gonna be sitting there waiting for a socket connection, gets a connection, advances to this line of code, sits on this and waits for some data to be received and then receives that data. 
Something similar will, will be in your code for other languages. For those of you using Java, Java Go, uh, C Sharp, you'll have something like this. Somewhere in your code, you're going to have a line of code or a method call or, some, or a callback or an event, some way to read data from the TCP socket. Every one of you has to have this. If you don't, you're probably using a library that you're not supposed to be using. Uh, which is none of you. We already went through the homework one stuff, unless you switched up your uh, what you're doing. Uh, every one of you has a line similar to this, something that reads data from the TCP socket. So hopefully everybody's good with that part. Uh, and a quick reminder of what TCP is and what it does is what it does is creates a persistent connection over the internet. So the internet just gives us the internet protocol IP. That's a way of sending data packets through the internet. TCP adds a layer on top of that, which creates a persistent connection, which gives us reliable communication between two entities on the internet that communicate over IP. So TCP adds a persistent connection and reliable delivery of information. Since this connection is persistent, this is a stream of data. So once a connection is established, both sides of the connection can communicate through this connection until one side closes the connection. They can continuously send bit, uh, bytes over this connection or bits, it could be bits. Um, and, uh, well, bits as bytes, it doesn't matter. But uh, each side can send those bytes over this connection so until it's closed. So the browser is gonna send us bytes representing a request for our purposes anyway, representing an HTTP request and we're going to send bytes over that stream that represents an HTTP response. Now for get requests, we can kind of ignore that. We can just say, yeah, we're just gonna get a request and we're gonna send a response. I don't care that it's a stream. I don't care that it's a persistent connection. And you can get away with that ignorance with small get requests or any get requests for our purposes in this class. With these get requests, you just read from the socket that contains your entire request. You parse that request, you handle it, however you're gonna handle it, and you send your response over the TCP socket, and then you forget that that socket ever exists. And then the browser, once they're done reading the data that you sent back to the browser, the browser's gonna close that TCP connection. Uh, that's pretty much how we use, uh, that is how we've used TCP connections so far in this class. And that's pretty much, uh, how we're, we'll use them moving forward in a, in a sense. Now, I don't need to foreshadow that. We're just going to talk about it. So for file uploads, this gets a little tricky. Well, like with get requests, we just read, we read once we get all the data, we handle the request and then we send our response. But what happens when we have post requests, which are fairly large, which are going to be larger then this number, if you're using Python, you probably just ignored this number completely up until now. Now it's going to be pretty important. The number, not so much, but what it represents is, this is the size of your buffer, which is the maximum amount of data that can be read in one call to this receive method. So you're saying, hey, if there's data to be read on the socket, on this stream, read at most 1K bytes of information from that stream. Well, what if your post request is larger than the size of your buffer? And you're saying, hey, Python, read at most 1K. Read at most 1K bytes from this socket. That's going to get you, you know, probably most of these headers, maybe a few bytes of the file, but you're not getting 91,000 bytes when you're reading at most 1K bytes. Numbers don't just don't add up. So you're not getting the entire request when the request is larger than your buffer size. JavaScript also has a buffer size. It's hidden. It doesn't let you say, here's the buffer size, and it doesn't force you to say the buffer size is, uh, is specified whenever you call this method. Uh, it just hides that those details from you. Yeah, why not? Mechatronic, you're, that's exactly something we're going to look for when we grade this assignment. You can't just make your, your number really, really large. Um, so there are reasons to buffer. If you have a very large, say somebody's uploading a one gigabyte file, 
you want to start processing that before they upload the entire thing. You don't want to wait for them to upload the entire file and then start your processing. Uh, there's also, say, uh, a Twitch stream. I'm uploading data to Twitch. Twitch isn't going to wait for me to upload all of my data before sending it, uh, processing it and sending it to you. There are lots of cases where we want to be processing as the data is coming in. Uh, and the shorter answer is it's just bad practice. Like, don't just, like, you can make it a really large number, but which number? What number are you going to put there to make sure that it covers everything? I mean, I don't know, a megabyte, a gigabyte, a terabyte? What if you put a terabyte and then your receive method starts waiting for a terabyte of information, depending on, you know, the situation? Uh what we're going to do instead is make buffers or petabytes. just make it petabytes. <laughs> Why not? Uh, and, and then just hope everything works out. Uh, and uh, I actually do want to take some long dot max value. Uh, there's a, a better reason for that too. If there's data to receive on the stream, if there's data sitting there that the client sent and it's sitting on your uh, like basically in your inbox of your TCP socket, receive is going to read up to 1024 bytes in this case, or petabytes in your case, exabytes. It's going to read up to exabytes of information that's available to be read. But what happens when the entire request is not there? You're going to read up to or everything that's available to be read. What some of you are seeing with image uploads is that sometimes the browser will send just the headers. The browser will send this information, send that over the TCP socket. They'll use their send all or, or send bits or uh, whatever their method is called in their language, the language of the browser. They're going to send the headers and then process the form, open the file, put the file into this multi-part form data stuff, and then after all that processing is done, then on that same TCP connection, send the rest of the data. In the meantime, your receive method said, ooh, I got data to receive, I'm gonna process it right now. And it's not sitting there and waiting for the rest of the re request, because your TCP socket, because that's not how we want anything to behave, your TCP socket doesn't know more data is coming, and it's not just going to sit there and wait because that's not the performance we want. We don't want our TCP sockets constantly going, whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on. There might be more data coming, so let me just hang out for a half a second or so just in case there's more data to be coming. So we can't control, like we can control everything on the server, but we can't control what the browsers are going to do. And for efficiency, the browser can send a request in multiple chunks that are delayed by you know, probably tens or maybe even hundreds of milliseconds long enough for our TCP socket of our libraries to sometimes only read the headers first in one chunk in our first receipt. So that's the better answer. That's the more thorough answer of why we're not going to just increase this number. Um, first, just bad practice and it's kind of lazy. But, uh, but two, there are situations that are fairly common that will just break. Uh, and I think that depends on the browser you're using. It's going to depend on your TCP library you're using, how long it's going to wait, because it will wait a little bit. Uh, when you call receive, you don't just always get the first byte of information. Uh, the TCP socket's not that antsy, that anxious. Um, but we can't just increase that and expect to get everything to work. You'll still have the problem of sometimes only getting the headers when a file is being uploaded. And then you say, there's no data for my file. Where is the data? Why is the browser not sending it? Well, the browser's sending it, but the way you're using your TCP socket, you're never reading that data. And what if the file is super huge? So we will, and uh, for the grading purposes, the answer to that question is, we're going to make sure that you didn't do that. We're going to look at the code and, and just make sure that, uh, one, we're uploading pretty large files and making sure that you handle those. Uh, this file, oh, where my separator is 1.8 megabytes, uh, you know, not super huge, but, uh, a decently large image that's going to overflow your buffers unless you're using some really silly, uh, value like exabytes. Uh, 
Uh, would you only get the headers if you're submitting a form that only includes text? In my experience, usually you will get all of the data when it's only text. But the file, reading from the hard drive, that's a pretty expensive operation. Any hard drive I.O., uh, any file I.O., it's going to take a while. So that's when you usually see the browsers looking for more efficiency. Uh, with just text, it's still possible, but in my experience, I've never seen it with just text forms. Because there's nothing to process. The, it, the browser just has to send that text. Uh, that takes, uh, like, no time. But once you have a disk read, is I don't know if you have to take... Do they cover this in 341 anymore? You don't have to take 3, 241 anymore if you're computer science. But somewhere in those classes, you should learn that reads are very expensive. And you got to, uh, what do they even call it, waterfall, I think. And uh, making branch predictions and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to try to get around the fact that file reads are really expensive. Those are slow, slow operations. They cover it in uh, Max. They cover it in 341 still. It's good, good. That's important stuff to know. Just knowing that a disk read, whenever you go to disk, it's a slow operation. And a lot of languages have things to that. Uh, oh, and 220. Good, good. So I can really rely on people knowing that. Uh, disk reads are slow. That's something you need to know in your career. Damn, Bubber Ducky. That's the problem with... I'm, I, won't go, I won't go on this path too long, but... Like, I like to rely on the information that I know you've covered in other classes. And so often, it's this This is the case where, yeah, they covered it, but I don't remember any of it. That was last semester. Why should I know that? It's because we're showing you, like, a whole thing so you can go out there in the world and do stuff um, with, with this good understanding of a well-rounded computer science education. And unfortunately, it doesn't work like that because... Students, even in 116, my students coming in don't know the 115 material. It's like, what do I even do with you at that point? <laughs> I mean, anyway, I don't want to go down that road. We can do that after lecture. Hardware can be frustrating. And you don't have to, as long as you have a good understanding of the limitations of the hardware and the strengths of the hardware. Like the CPU is fast, is, is, it's crazy fast with like adding a little bit slower with multiplication, slower with division. And then once you get into to uh, more higher order operations, it's going to slow things down quite a bit. Um, and if you can get things to, like, for example, multiplying by two, never multiply by two, a hard-coded two in your code. Always shift to the left by one bit because that's a much, much faster operation in your CPU. Uh, things like that. You need to have an understanding of that when the hardware affects your programs. Especially when you're working on efficiency, when you're trying to get uh, get things optimized, you need to be aware of what the hardware is actually doing, so you can write really quality code. Uh, I've I've had a I had an issue like that before, where I was doing a bunch of math in a program that was in a function that was being called like millions of times in my program, and I rewrote the whole function to instead of algebra using all bitwise operations, it was a tremendous speed up. Because it's just one operation in the, the CPU, in the ALU. Just one operation. Instead of going through the full adder and doing all that stuff. Or, God forbid, a multiplier. A multiplication is so expensive compared to a bitwise operation. Anyway, this isn't a hardware class. But we do have to be aware of some of those things. Today, we need to be aware of buffers. Uh, and part of what you're seeing in your servers is the fact that the file, reading a file from disk is slow. The browser is going to send just the header sometimes while it's waiting for the file to be read. Because those few milliseconds, like maybe it's not a tremendous amount of time, but if it if your web page takes that much longer to load, you know, you're starting to lose some performance. And browsers are all about speed. They are so optimized these days to try to get your pages loading as fast as possible. Losing a few milliseconds. You know, however long it takes to read this file, especially if it's a large file in this case, and you're waiting for that before sending any information to the server and not giving the server a chance to start processing the request, setting up its buffers and um, and getting started, you know, you're, you're starting to lose 100 milliseconds. If you lose a tenth of a second on a page load, it's a horrible, horrible inefficiency uh, in the terms of in terms of web.
just to send that file, not to mention all the other stuff that has to happen, rendering the JavaScript and everything. I mean, nobody wants to wait more than a second for their page to load, and even that's pushing it. I've, I've many times in my life had to click the link and had it taking more than a second to load or like two seconds to load. I'll just go somewhere else. There's enough content on the internet that I ain't got to wait for your slow ass site. So getting this efficiency is important and we're going to have to handle it in the servers. We can't just say, hey, browser, why don't you be a little less efficient? Because I don't feel like coding that. I mean, we can't do that. You can't do that in your career. It's not how we roll here. Content length is bytes. All right, so let's talk about buffers. How do we address this? So this is how your TCP socket works. I think I got ahead of my slides a bit here. But, uh, but you're going to call that method that's going to receive at most a certain amount of bytes, which I'll represent here as a little square, a little red square. This is the data that the user is sending to your server. You, they send information over this TCP socket. There's information sitting there on the socket waiting to be read by your server. And then no matter what language you have, you have some method that's either going to be called if you have event-based architectures or a method that you're calling to read bytes off of that socket. When there's bytes to be read, those are going to be read by your socket and all of your code is going to run to process those bytes. But what if we have multiple chunks of data being sent or more information being sent than the size of our buffer? Or what if we just have a continuous stream? What if we're watching a YouTube video? You're not going to wait for the entire video to download before watching it. And of course, you're aware of buffering there. Uh, the context that you probably use buffering in uh, before you study buffering at all is uh, when your video when your video just pauses and you see the loading screen, uh, we, we say it's buffering. Well, yeah, because it's still reading bytes from that TCP connection from the server trying to get more information loaded and then appended to the end of your runtime so you can continue watching that video. But your video should load pretty much immediately when you start watching it. You go to YouTube, you click a, a video, it's gonna start playing before it's done downloading because it's because of this idea of buffering. The information is being read before all of it's being read. It's being processed before all of it has been read. Uh, that's where that idea of buffering comes from. So we're not, that's not, that specific example is not where it comes from. Don't, don't think uh, that's what I'm saying. Um, but that idea of buffering that you have, this is where it comes from, is this idea of uh, reading data in chunks from a connection. So we're going to read this in chunks. We're going to read some amount of information, start processing it, read the next amount of information, start processing it, et cetera, et cetera, until there's no more information to be read, or we know that we've, or rather we know that we've read all of the information. For our purposes, content length is going to tell us that when we're done reading the information. Uh, and there can be delays between these packets, as we mentioned. Uh, the browser might send the headers, then go to disk, read the file that the user is uploading, and then send the contents of the file afterwards. We can have things like that. So it's not always just overflowing your buffer, but there can be a time delay, which is going to throw off your code. These buffers are usually just a couple kilobytes. Uh, this also uh, this also flashes back to, I think it was just mentioned on one slide earlier in the, the semester, but some, uh, some browsers have a limit on the total length of the, the HTTP headers, which is usually just a few kilobytes. Part of the reason for that is that they can guarantee that in one buffer load that they read from the TCP socket, they're getting all of the HTTP headers. So if the headers are allowed to be arbitrary size, it really jams up our buffering and we don't really know how to handle that. We can write code to handle it, but there are other reasons as well why we don't wanna, why we wanna limit the, uh, the size of the headers. So usually a few kilobytes at most that you're gonna read in a single call to the buffer. Uh, that was in the context of why don't we just throw the uh, when we want to do file uploads, why can't we just throw that in like a query string? It's because of these limits, and these limits are there in part um, so we can actually read the headers of the HTTP request. If we have a gigabyte of information in the URL itself in a query string, that's going to be difficult to parse, nay impossible to parse in certain situations, potentially. Maybe not impossible, I shouldn't use that word, but difficult and painful. 
and it's going to really open you up to DDoS attacks because you have to read uh, exabytes of information before getting to the headers. Somebody's just going to send you an exabyte of garbage. DDoS. Not even DDoS, just DOS. Done. Uh, so anyway, lots of reasons, but there are limits on the headers. This is good for our purposes as well. When we receive a request, you can assume... Uh, when you receive a GET request, you can always assume that you're reading it in one call to the buffer. As long as you're not trying to exploit a loophole, uh, if in Python you say your buffer size is one, and then you say you should get full credit because you could said I could assume that, you know, besides you know stuff like that, you can assume that any reasonable buffer size, one k or larger, you're going to read the entire GET request in one read. You can also assume that you're going to read the headers of a POST request in one read to the uh, one read to the socket. So you can assume you get a POST request. You read a post or get request because you don't even know what it is yet. You can read one buffer full. Look for that slash r slash n slash r slash n. That's the end of the headers. Read all the headers and assume that that character one, that substring will exist, the slash r slash n slash r slash n. You can assume that will exist in the first read to the socket from the socket if you're not buffering already. And uh, you can assume that that contains all the headers. So the first time you read from a socket, if you're not already buffering, you can safely parse the headers and get things like content length out of there. Uh, so we will assume that, uh, that we can do that. So after that, what do we do? Well, uh, I, I almost said it gets a little tricky, but it's not too tricky. This isn't too bad, but it is stuff where you have to take this concept and apply it to your code. What we want to do is get that first read from the socket. Get those first chunk of bytes. Look for that CRLF, CRLF, which, by the way, I say CRLF and slash R slash N interchangeably. Those are the same thing. Um, look for that CRLF, CRLF. That's the end of your headers. Parse all the headers. Figure out what kind of request you're dealing with. The most important piece of information in terms of determining really what to do with this is, uh, well, first of all, is it a post request? And if it's a post request, check the content length. Once you get the content length, now you know what's coming. You re Then after that CRLF, CRLF, you see how many bytes there are, which might be zero on that first read. Uh, if, it, if the browser is optimizing file uploads, like we said, and only sending the headers, there might be zero bytes of information in the body of that first uh, in that first read from the server. That first chunk of bytes that you get might be zero. You read the content length to check how many bytes you are expecting, and then you keep calling receive or however you're you have it set up to call to read bytes off of the socket, the TCP socket. You keep calling that until you get all of the data. How do you know when to stop? Check the content length. Each time you receive data after the headers, add that to some data structure, and then keep accumulating bytes in that data structure until the size of that data structure is the content length. Once the size of that data structure, so say your data structure is a byte array, the simplest one you could use in this case, your data structure is a byte array, you're gonna keep reading from the TCP socket until that byte array has size equal to content length. If it's not equal to content length, you got to keep reading from the TCP socket and waiting for the browser, the client, to keep sending you more information until they sent all of the information that they're sending, which they specified in the content length. And we mentioned briefly earlier, this is where, this is just a side note for, uh, for this, uh, but this is where denial of service attacks can come in. Those DOSs is you send information with a content length of like, oh excuse me, a content length of like, I don't know, a thousand, and then you send like nine hundred bytes of information after that. Depending on how the server is coded, it, it should be waiting for a while for that last hundred bytes to be sent until it finally times out. But depending on how that timeout is set, you can send a lot of requests like that and have the server 
uh, taking up all of its threads, if it's multi-threaded, or just taking up a lot of resources waiting on all these requests to finish. And then an even more malicious attack, you send the headers, say it's a thousand bytes or an exabyte of content length, and then they start trickling one byte at a time over a long period of time, just long enough so the server never times out and it has to keep that TCP connection open. Uh, there are some some uh, DOS attacks there. And then once you DDoS it, you have you know, a million machines all doing the same thing. That's when you take down a server. Yeah, it does sound pretty evil. And, but what if the server is evil? Ooh, but then, then it could be a good thing. Uh, but no, seriously, don't DDoS anyone. <laughs> Unless they're seriously, ob you know, objectively evil. Then maybe. Uh, look at you, X don't crash Xbox Live. I want to... <laughs> I want to, yeah, the, some of the users of Xbox Live, don't get me wrong, but like I just play single player games on my Xbox and I want to upload, I use Xbox Live, it uploads my save files. I want my save files to be able to be downloaded. So it's because my Xbox keeps corrupting my save files, I have to wipe them and re-download from Xbox Live. Can't figure out how to fix that one. Uh, I need Xbox Live to get my save files. Don't crash Xbox Live, please. Um, but uh, anyway, so with buffers... Uh, just a quick rundown. We're reading bytes from the socket, parsing all the headers, because we can assume that as long as we're not buffering already, we're going to get all of the headers in the first read from that socket, as long as we have a buffer of at least 1K in bytes of information. Read the content length and remember it, and then keep reading, keep receiving data until you've read content length number of bytes uh, and you're storing that much information. Once you have that much information, the content length, number of bytes in the body of the request, then you can process the thing. Then you can finally say, okay, I have the whole thing. Uh, I have the entire request. Now I can parse it, process it, find the bytes of the file, never convert those to a string, save the file onto my hard drive, and host that file for other users to request. But without buffering, you're not going to be able to support file uploads not properly anyway you might be able to handle small files depending on how everything works um definitely not large files there are a few assumptions you can make on homework three you can assume that only one user is uploading a file at any given time this means you don't have to support multiple simultaneous tcp connections yet if you want to support this, I do recommend, if you have some spare time and you're doing well on the assignment, I do recommend that you implement this to support this. So instead of your buffer being like a um, a data structure, uh, instead of being like just a byte array and you're reading that until the size of the byte array is equal to the content length, instead change that to a map, a map of users to buffers and track each user's buffer independently of each other in that data structure, any key value store data structures. When we talk about WebSockets, we will have multiple simultaneous TCP connections because WebSockets will maintain persistent TCP connections. Effectively, what a WebSocket does is takes an HTTP request for a WebSocket connection and then leaves that TCP connection open and converts it to a WebSocket connection. So you're going to have multiple TCP sockets open simultaneously for homework four. So if you want to implement that, if you want to get ahead of the game, I, I do recommend that you do that. For homework three, you can make the assumption that only one TCP connection is active at a time to simplify your buffering. You, if you're buffering, you can assume that every read of bytes from the TCP socket is for that user that's currently buffering for that current file, for that current HTTP request, and handle one HTTP request at a time though one HTTP request might be multiple reads from the TCP socket. Uh, you can assume all the headers are read. I've said this a few times. You can assume all the headers are read in that first read from the TCP connection. So you can safely read from the TCP connection, parse the headers, read the content length, and figure out how much information you expect. And we will check your buffer size, so no exabytes in your buffer size through the library. Don't just have the library do all your work for you. I do want to see that all of you can handle buffering. So we will be checking for this uh, while grading. We'll be checking to make sure you didn't just put some silly large number here. All right. 
And now let's get to, get to this part where I think I'm going to restart VS Code and hope that works. Right before lecture, it was my terminal in VS Code stopped scrolling, of all things. I couldn't scroll. So what I have here is a... Hopefully that reset did it. What I have here is a a uh, node server. This is the one I've shown before in class. Uh, I changed the output a little bit. So when we receive data, I'm going to check the length of that data. Did VS Code just completely crash? Windows, this is why I don't trust you. I'm going to print out the length of the byte array that's received. So JavaScript, as you know now, since you've been through homework, oh, do you know that yet? I guess you would have to start um, start three. Uh, data is always going to be received as bytes, as a byte array. And then I'm not going to convert this to a string at all. I'm going to check its length and just print out how many bytes of data I've read from the socket. And then I'm going to print out the first 2K bytes of information as a string. So I am converting this to a string. If you have a string plus a byte array, the byte array is going to be converted into a string. This plus will be the string concatenation operator. Calls to string on this and then prints that to the screen. So when this is part bytes of a file, I expect garbage. If I did the same thing in Python, I would expect the program to crash because Python will say, hey, I can't convert that to a string. In Python, you would have your, your str and then parentheses, and it's going to say invalid encoding or something like that. So just a few changes, and the code itself, I'm skipping it if it's not the first uh, read. I don't want to show that because then I'll see it in all your homeworks, and then uh, it's not something you should be doing. Um, but I'm going to skip processing it if it's buffering because I'm not actually doing anything with the buffers in this example. And if it's not buffering, I'm going to serve the HTML for this. So let's run this server. The important things are just printing out uh, what it's doing. So let's run this server. Let's go over here. Server's running. I get my request for the root path. I got 687 bytes of information. And most of that is this silly cookie that IntelliJ uh, puts at the end here. And my user agent, we talked about this briefly earlier, but my user agent, which leaks a lot of information about me, about my system that I'm using. So if you want to know something about my system, it's a Windows NT 10, 64-bit, uh, and then uh, th enough information to tell you that I'm using Opera, but these uh, user agents are really, uh, really evolved in a strange way. So let me use this form to upload a file. And I'm going to upload this uh, Twitch PNG that we saw earlier. Submit that. Let's see what we get on the server. Hey, it's scrolling. Thank you. Thank you for working with me a little, Windows. Uh, or at least Microsoft, I should say. They wrote the operating system I'm using. They wrote the text editor I'm using. Um, so I get my uh, 10,000 bytes of information. It's a post request for the path form path. And I can check my content length, 9,900 bytes of information. And then I can see all of the bytes for the file in this format we expect in this, um, in this uh, multi-part form data format. And I can see the entire content of my file. I know it's the entire content of my file, or at least I could if I did a little math. I'm quite certain this is the entire content of the file. Because I received 10,000 bytes, my file was about 10,000 bytes, and like 800, 840 bytes of overhead, which happens to be very similar to uh, the 687, plus the extra bytes for all these boundaries and all these headers. You know, it feels about right. You know, I, I wouldn't code my server to just be like, well, it feels right. But, you know, it looks right enough at this point. Uh, that this is probably the entire file. I probably got it all in one shot. So this file, with this browser, with this, with Node, uh, with Opera, with on Windows, you know, all of that combination of stuff, I did end up getting the entire file in one request. 
depending on what you're using, what libraries and everything, uh, you might not get that. Some of you are getting that. I think in I think in Scala, I was seeing that too, where I was only getting the headers. Uh, it, it's a common thing. It's expected. And it means you got to do your buffering. So let's... So let's go back and let's upload a different file because that one's not too interesting. Let's upload this elephant. This is a bigger file. And let's take a look at this one. So here we got 21,000 bytes of information. Uh, yeah, 230 kilobyte will, will get you there as long as you're not uh, increasing your buffer size to exabytes or like we were mentioning earlier uh, 230 kilobytes will be fine should get you there uh, so here I'm getting 21,000 bytes of data but my content length is 68,000 so now I know hey I didn't get all the data so for your, when you're parsing this request you're gonna parse the headers which you can assume you get in one shot and this new line Read this content length. Check that, not against the bytes you receive. Uh, so it's not this total information, but the bytes that you receive minus all of the headers. So starting here, how many bytes am I reading? So this minus the number of bytes in my header, including that CRLF, CRLF. That's the number of bytes that I've read as part of the body of this request which I know isn't going to be this entire 68,000 because the entire number of bytes, including the headers, was not 68,000. So of course, I don't have the full request here. So uh, all I'm doing is returning a 404 for this server. I'm not really doing anything with this data. But we can scroll down. We can see that we get some of the information of the file. And I do cut this at 2K. I'm only cutting that at 2K. Uh, because it'll flood my terminal with all kinds of information, all kinds of garbage uh, from the file. And I just don't want clutter in the terminal. So that's, if you're wondering, that's the only reason I'm limiting this. Or else I'd be scrolling through all kinds of, uh, you know, this kind of non-UTF-8 encoded data that I'm improperly trying to decode as UTF-8. It's not going to not gonna work. Content length does not include the headers. Content length is only the length of the body of the request. It follows the same exact thing that you did when you were sending information, when you're sending bodies in your responses, HTTP responses. You only included the length of the body of your response. The browser is going to do the same exact thing because they're following the same exact protocol. Uh, and you'll see that a lot in homework three. You're doing the same things you did in homework two. You're just on the other side of the fence. You're receiving the, the, the requests, the HTTP messages with bodies instead of sending them. But it's the same exact format. And then we can see we got more data. This time we got 48,000 bytes of information. And the first 2K bytes, we can see that we're getting more image data. It's just a whole bunch of image data. At this point, if you were not buffering, what your server is going to do is take this data, look for CRLF, CRLF, or... Uh, in homework two terms, in homework one terms, you would be reading the first line. So you would implicitly be decoding this as UTF-8, reading the first line, splitting it on spaces, and looking for the path. Well, guess what's going to happen when you're trying to do that with this data? Everything breaks. Everything breaks once you get this second chunk of data containing the file. So once you start buffering, once the entire request is not read in that first call to receive or in this case the first data event things are going to break if you're not handling buffering if you're not buffering you're going to try to parse this as a request you're not going to find a request line you're not going to find any of the stuff you expect and your parsing is going to break then we get the end of the request if we add these up 48,000 Plus 21,000 minus overhead. Seems about right. Got that 68,000 bytes. So in two requests, we got that message. We got that file upload. Well, we can go bigger. 
Let's take this lovely screenshot, which I don't even know what I was doing. I think I was making videos for 199. Anyway, I found a large file on my system. Let's send this one. And here's where maybe it's only on these really large files that it messes up. So let's actually change this a little bit. Mm, I do want to, how do I do this? Yeah, this is where I'm going to run into the issues that I've seen. At least it worked for the first two. If that's all we get, hey, that's okay. Maybe that is just overflowing the buffer of the terminal. Terminals will only store so much history. Uh, so I do have a backup plan, but I'm not super happy about it. I'm just not going to print out the samples, which kind of sucks because we won't be able to see content length. Um, but this is what I'm, it's a sacrifice I'm prepared to make. So now we don't actually see the samples. We won't see the content length here because I commented that out, but we can pretend. So we receive our first chunk of data and we get 17,000 bytes of information, which will include all the headers, which will include the content length, which unfortunately we don't get to see anymore, uh, but we do get that information. Actually, 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 I can do this. Let me just move this. I have this set up. I got this set up. Let me just put that right there. We do always get there. It had me a little nervous today. I didn't think we'd get there. But I do get to show the full example. So here we get our first 17,000 bytes of information. This is something else apparently. Wait, oh yeah, because because uh, I have the end request uh, right here before the rest of it. Then I'm printing out the headers of this. We get the headers in the first request, which will show content length, which I've been so bad at eyeballing. We get the content length. This is a... 1.5 megabyte file that I'm uploading. So we get the content length. We know how much information we have to read. And that's going to take many reads from the TCP socket to actually get this entire file. And here we can see nodes built in buffer size. We get this, uh, oh, I, I, is this uh, 16, 16 squared? Anyway, like 65,000 bytes. Of information it's a power of two uh, so 65 bytes of information we keep reading 65 bytes at a time until the last read we get the rest of the file and then we have the entire file is it 2 to the 16 I'm sorry what I say 2 to the 8 or did I say 2 to the 16 um, and then we get all the information for that file and then we can start processing the request but you can see we have many reads here many times that we have to read information from that TCP socket in order to get the entire file. And we should be buffering perfectly fine, and that's no big deal. We just read a bunch of times and stitch all that information together. Oh, man, now we went over time. Um, but I do want to do the last one. Here's just lecture slides. It's not an image. But we can see an even larger file. We just read from the socket a whole bunch of times. We stitch all that information together. It's just by pure chance one of those was formatted like that. And we might have overflown the console buffer just with this up. Yeah, we did. Came this far. I'm going to finish it. And the last one's less than 65K. And somewhere up here, you should see the content length, 13.7 megabytes. We only get 17K in the first read. And we got to read from the, buff from the TCP socket many, many times until we get that full file.